So I split my activity between uh, various organizations. I don't have like one uh, big umbrella organization that uh, I represent or anything. It's just uh, uh, I use uh, uh, various uh, commercial organizations and investment companies uh, such as uh, uh, MetaPlanet Holdings, which is my primary investment vehicle, to invest in uh, various startups, including artificial intelligence companies. And then I have uh, one uh, non-profit foundation called Solenum Foundation uh, that I use uh, to support uh, various uh, so-called existential risk uh, organizations around the world. So I have a very interesting life. I was born behind the Iron Curtain uh, to in uh, Soviet occupied Estonia and uh, looked forward to a pretty bleak life. Uh, mostly, I guess, in some scientific institute trying to figure out how to uh, kill more Americans. Uh, luckily, though, uh, Soviet Union collapsed uh, just shortly before I was uh, ready for independent life. So uh, the year 90, uh, 1990, uh, when I went to university, it was also like the, in the middle of big turmoil where uh, yeah, Soviet Union uh, collapsed and uh, uh, various countries, including Estonia, became independent. And after, uh, like, when I went to university, I uh, studied physics there. And the reason I studied physics was that I uh, was actually uh, into computer programming already since uh, high school or even a little bit earlier so I thought I should like expand my horizons a little bit and I do think it has helped me uh, quite a lot like if you look uh, look around uh, people in the so-called existential risk ecosystem uh, that I support there's uh, like I would say like overrepresentation of physicists there uh, because I think it helps to physics helps you to see the world uh, in a neutral manner. You, you see a world that's composed of atoms and, and you, you, you therefore try to make your world models or predictions based on uh, what you... Uh, basically, you have curiosity that helps you to uh, create the world model rather than uh, you... Uh, sort of Try to world, try to model the world in a way that uh, kind of suits your predispositions. After uh, yeah, having studied physics, I was uh, uh, like I worked with computers throughout uh, an entire uh, you know, period of uh, of university, uh, and I we went uh, from developing computer games. Uh, we, jokingly called ourselves as uh, the uh, computer games industry of Estonia because we were really the only computer games, commercial computer games development uh, studio in Estonia. Uh, but uh, after spending a decade uh, developing computer games, uh, like, there was this uh, I have one talk where I describe my life as surfing the Moore's law. Like uh, interesting uh, like turning points in my life have kind of coincided with uh, things that Moore's law has made possible or uh, has has made kind of uh, no longer feasible. So, for example, we exited uh, computers, computer games industry, when uh, graphics cards came along, uh, thus enabling uh, much more powerful storytelling um, capabilities, therefore uh, actually reducing the need uh, or reducing the importance that the programming played in computer games. And because we, being mostly uh, good at programming, uh, didn't really have good uh, uh, comparative advantage in this kind of new world, we actually ended up exiting the computer games uh, business and going into internet programming. At which point we met uh, Nicholas and Janus, who became the main, eventually became the main founders of uh, Skype. And, and together with them, the first the, we first did the uh, Gazal uh, file sharing application, which got us into a bunch of legal trouble. 
And after Kazaa, we did a few smaller projects and eventually ended up doing Skype. The way we uh, got into games industry was uh, almost by accident. Uh, so we were... The nice thing uh, about uh, starting your computer career with computers that are really slow is that you actually have to uh, do work in order to make them to do something interesting. Whereas like these days, uh, I see that my my children, for example, have like tough time starting programming because like YouTube is just one click away. Uh, so uh, as I learned how to program computers, uh, just trying to figure out how to make interesting games was kind of a natural step of, of our evolution of a programmer. Uh, so it was in 89, I think, uh, 1989, where I teamed up with uh, couple of my classmates uh, to uh, develop uh, uh, a simple graphical uh, action-based computer game and we managed to uh, sell that uh, game to uh, Sweden uh, and uh, we earned uh, a lot of hard currency, Swedish kronas, uh, as a result, uh, which at the time of uh, of the collapse of Soviet Union when Russian ruble was in free fall was a fortune. I think we made like $5,000 based on that, which was like incredibly big sum uh, back then. And hence we were kind of hooked. I uh, thought that, okay, we can do something that uh, uh, other people are willing to pay money for and, and, and uh, ended up uh, uh, developing bigger and bigger games and spent uh, about one decade in, in games. Yeah, people do ask me quite a lot, like, what, what is the secret of Estonia uh, when it comes to uh, sort of advancing digital ideas and, and uh, uh, programming and technology in general. Uh, and it, it's kind of hard to track down this to one cause, but uh, there are a few contributing, contributing factors, I think. Like one thing was that uh, even during Soviet times, there was this uh, like big scientific... Uh, center uh, called like Institute of Cybernetics uh, in Tallinn uh, that uh, housed many many scientists who developed things like expert systems and uh, sort of yeah, early precursors of AI uh, and uh, uh, I mean I'm kind of proud to say that that Skype actually has played quite quite a big role in uh, in Estonian startup ecosphere like for, for various reasons. So one is that Estonia is a small place, so uh, people know each other and, and uh, I kind of half jokingly say that, that uh, quite a lot of people who just uh, knew the Skype boys as, as uh, we're called in uh, Estonia uh, and they think that well if they can do it well so can I. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other nice thing uh, side effect of Skype is that uh, it kind of, it's a fairly big company in uh, Estonian context, so a lot, it kind of works as a training ground. Uh, a lot of people meet there, get their uh, experience working together, working for an international, um, work, working in international context, and uh, a few. Like, it's, Skype is no longer a startup, but it used to be a strong startup. We used to have a like, strong startup culture there. Uh, so even now I think I have invested in three or four uh, companies that are just made by Skype alumni. So, so there's a strong startup uh, culture there. And finally, uh, I think Estonian government has gotten into, into a nice positive feedback loop where they have done a few digital innovations like in the domain of e-governance and they have gotten uh, a very good uh, uh, a positive feedback uh, based on their achievements I mean, things like uh, digital voting and paperless government office and so uh, and they like, whenever humans get into positive feedback loop they want to do more of the uh, things that they get praised for and indeed like uh, I think the latest project was uh, called um, uh, Estonian uh, digital e-residency uh, mm -hmm. so you can uh, go to an Estonian consulate, as far as I understand, and get uh, a chip card that will give you the ability to give digital signatures that uh, actually have the power of law in, in uh, Estonia, hence mm -hmm. in EU.
So Skype actually started as a, a project within another company. Uh, the, the other company was called uh, Jolted. It was founded by Niklas Sandström and Janus Fries. Uh, and within that company we first did uh, various projects including the, uh, the backend uh, for Gaza file sharing uh, network. And Skype was started as, uh, in late 2002 as a project within that uh, company. Uh, but just a few months uh, later it was spun off into a separ into separate company and seven people got uh, founding shares in this new company called uh, Skyper. It was called Skyper, uh, Skyper Limited. Uh, we ended up actually having... Uh, the name Skyper came from uh, uh, Sky Pier because the original idea wasn't actually to do uh, uh, like voice over IP client. The original idea was to do Wi-Fi sharing, uh, but uh, Skyper.net or was it Skyper.com was taken, so we ended up chopping the R off from the end. No, Skype was not the first uh, VoIP. Uh, so in fact, like when we started with this idea of Wi-Fi sharing, uh, developing a Wi-Fi sharing network, uh, uh, Skyper, then uh, our thinking was that uh, clearly there are like uh, uh, VoIP software out there that we should uh, kind of uh, import and uh, implement on top of our Wi-Fi sharing network to give like people incentive uh, to join the, join our network. However, after having evaluated uh, like, um, the existing offerings that were out there, we determined that none of them really worked properly uh, behind firewalls. The, the voice over IP, the state of voice over IP back then was that. Uh, latest thing uh, that was called uh, SIP, Session Initiation Protocol, Session Initiation Protocol. Uh, it was like a new standard that was uh, roughly modeled after email. The, but the problem was that uh, just like with email, you just can't, you need like a ISP or some uh, third party to set, set you up with this. You can't uh, start uh, just an email program and be like immediately connected. You need to connect that email program to some server, and which creates the chicken and egg situation uh, in a VoIP world where there were no VoIP servers at that point. Uh, we figured out that we really need a, like a peer-to-peer -peer solution uh, where people wouldn't be, people could bootstrap the network without being reliant on their ISPs in, in installing some gateways or, or things. So yeah, after having empirically determined that the existing uh, voice over IP uh, like although uh, sufficient for our purposes technically they wouldn't uh, really work because of the like the sort of architectural requirements uh, they had uh, the chicken and egg situation so we decided that okay let's let's do our own uh, voice over IP program and that eventually ended up dropping this Wi-Fi sharing network ID altogether and just focused on the on the voice over IP. Skype has sold like has Skype has been sold uh, three or four times depending how you count. Uh, myself and uh, the uh, founders uh, sold our shares to uh, the first during the first sale which was to eBay in uh, I think it was this was September two thousand five. Uh, so two years after we launched Skype and after that uh, eBay sold the uh, majority of the shares to, uh, uh, to a private equity company and a consortium of uh, uh, VCs I think and uh, I don't even remember it was 2010 or 2011 when Microsoft uh, bought, bought the whole thing. From Skype I eased out gradually. I did, did, there was no, uh, no sharp point where I, where I left Skype. Uh, one sort of uh, moment where I significantly reduced my involvement in Skype was uh, uh, 2009 when, when there was this uh, big lawsuit between the uh, founders of Skype and uh, private, private equity companies that had bought uh, uh, shares from uh, shares of Skype uh, from eBay, and there was some like technology licensing issues. Uh, and because I ended up uh, on the other 
side of that lawsuit and Skype, uh, I, my day-to-day -day activities in Skype were hindered. And when I came back to Skype, uh, like half a year later, uh, the company had moved along uh, quite a lot, so it was actually hard for me to you know, fit in, uh, fit right back in. So I ended up just like gradually um, sort of easing out from the from the day-to-day -day activities. Already during this, um, already during during the lawsuit that uh, uh, Skype had, I was uh, you know, looking around for what what other important things there might be to do in the world. And I ended up reading uh, the writings of uh, Eliezer Rutkowski, an AI researcher in, uh, in California. And uh, I found like an interesting, found him first of all very interesting, uh, but also he was like making a, a very important argument uh, that uh, the default outcome from AI is not necessarily good. We actually have to put in effort in order to make the uh, outcomes from AI uh, once they get powerful enough, uh, good. So once I got interested in these topics, I was uh, like uh, more and more willing uh, to contribute my time and, and money to actually advancing the uh, what's called existential risk ecosystem. Uh, people thinking about not just about uh, risks from technology, like AI technology, but also from other technologies such as, such as synthetic biology or nanotechnology. So when it comes to existential risks, uh, there are sort of two big categories of existential risks. Uh, one category is uh, sort of uh, uh, natural existential risks, uh, such as uh, uh, supervolcanoes, for example, or uh, asteroid impacts, like every 10 to 100 million years, uh, a big enough asteroid comes along that just potentially uh, destroys the planet. Uh, now, the interesting thing about, uh, or the sort of nice thing about natural uh, existential risk is that, that these are risks that we have lived uh, with uh, for our entire history. Uh, so uh, they aren't necessarily getting bigger over time. Uh, however, the other category is technological existential risks, uh, risks from uh, uh, either uh, deliberate or ex existential misapplication of, ever in of technology of ever increasing power. And uh, there, as we know, that there's like an exponential increase in the power of uh, computers and other technology, uh, we are really entering like uncharted uh, territory uh, in this century. Therefore, uh, foresight is a like, really uh, important to have and, and uh, we need to figure out how to steer the technological progress to ensure safe outcomes. So I uh, started um, engaging with the uh, existential risk ecosystem in 2009 already. I remember uh, meeting up with uh, Eliezer Jutkowski who, whose uh, writings I had been uh, reading and uh, uh, then uh, kind of, uh, uh, starting to engage with other people in the existential risk community and seeing like how I can help. Like uh, first I just started uh, donating money uh, but eventually uh, ended up uh, supporting uh, like more and more organizations and doing sort of like a cross-pollination uh, between those organizations by, by introducing people and making sure that they, their activities are more coordinated than they otherwise would be. And also finally I ended up uh, co-founding uh, two new organizations. Uh, one was, uh, one is uh, at the Cambridge University we have an organization called Center for the Study of Existential Risk, uh, co-founded with Hugh Price, who is the Bernard Russell Professor of Philosophy at Cambridge University, and Martin Rees, who back then used to be uh, the Master of Trinity College, and is a very well-known scientist, who, ha who has actually written a book about uh, existential risks uh, himself. And the other organization that I helped to co-found uh, is at uh, MIT uh, here in the US. Uh, it's called the Future of Life Institute and it's uh, led by Max Tegmark, who is a well-known uh, physicist at MIT. There, there's an interesting point though about uh, what is the role of computer science and I, I, I think people, well, I mean obviously I'm biased because I'm a, I'm a computer person, but uh, I, what I have found is that there is actually a very fertile uh, intersection of computer science and philosophy. And, and the reason is that uh, 
uh, like a lot of the philosophy has been kind of uh, throughout the history philosophy has uh, uh, really leaned on human intuitions uh, the philosophy like analytical philosophy tries to uh, like make concepts precise but uh, when doing so they uh, come up with examples and counterexamples to delineate the concepts uh, that uh, really lean on human intuitions and we know from psychological research that human intuitions aren't really uh, sort of uh, fundamental entities in the world like if you do different experiments in different cultures for example people have completely different uh, intuitions they even see like different visual illusions so like when you introduce computer science then Dana Dennett actually has been has said that uh, computers keep philosophy honest uh, you can uh, uh, when you actually, instead of leaning, when you make a philosophical argument and you don't lean on intuitions, but you lean on programs, you, you, you basically point to a program and say that this is what I mean, uh, then you're actually on much, much more solid ground because you're not, no longer uh, influenced on, on how, what the intuitions tell humans and how they differ from, from culture to culture. Like, one, one thing that I say is that uh, philosophy, human philosophy has uh, had like thousands of years to come up with uh, kind of interesting passages of thought and and uh, uh, like, uh, explore the thought space, etc. But now we need answers, and, and, and these answers have to be there, like in a decade or two, and those answers have to be in the form of computer code. Elon Musk actually uh, said that his uh, uh, interview at TED uh, conference a couple of years ago that there. Are two kinds of uh, thinking, like uh, uh, most of humanity, uh, like all the humanity in most, most of the time engages in uh, what you call like uh, metaphorical thinking or, or analog based, based thinking. They, they bring in metaphors from different domains and then uh, apply them uh, to the domain that they want to analyze. Uh, which is like kind of uh, things that we do intuitively, and it, and it's uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, it's quick, cheap, but it's imprecise. And the other kind of thinking is uh, that you really reason from first principles. Uh, it's slow, painful, and uh, like uh, most of the people really don't do it. Uh, but uh, that's reasoning from first principles is really the only way uh, we can do, we can deal with um, unforeseen things uh, in a sufficiently rigorous manner. So, for example, sending a man to the moon, or or uh, yeah, creating a rocket. It's it's uh, something if it hasn't hasn't done before hasn't been done before. You can't just use like an analogy that oh we just uh, think about how would, would I behave if I were a rocket and, and then, then like go from there. No, you know, you actually have to do the calculations. And the thing with existential risk is, is the same. It's, uh, it's hard to reason about them. These are things that have never happened, uh, but uh, they are like incredibly important and uh, you have to engage in this uh, slow and labor laborious uh, process of uh, really listening to the arguments and not kind of pattern matching to them in, in, in things that you might think might be relevant. So the reasons why I'm, why I'm really engaged in, the, in trying to lower the existential risks has to do with, uh, with the fact that I'm pretty uh, of, uh, convinced uh, consequentialist. I do think that we have to have responsibility uh, for modeling, or we have to take responsibility for modeling the consequences of our actions and then pick the actions that yield to the better, best outcomes. So, uh, like, moreover, when you uh, kind of start thinking about uh, what are the, like in the palette of actions that you have, what are the things that you should uh, pay a special pay uh, special attention, special attention, attention to. Mm. Then uh, one argument that can be made is that you should pay attention to uh, areas where you expect your marginal impact to be the highest. Uh, meaning that uh, 
there are clearly like very important issues about uh, inequality in the world or uh, global warming, but uh, I couldn't make a significant difference in, in, in these areas. Uh, so I kind of uh, ended up gravitating. Uh, so when I basically, basically found that there is this massively, massively underappreciated uh, topic of existential risks, uh, I, I saw immediately that I could make a significant difference there. First by bringing more reputation uh, to these arguments or more credibility to those, to, to those arguments. So I basically started with uh, taking those arguments, uh, like uh, internalizing them, then repackaging them in, in, in my own words and then using my kind of street credibility uh, to give talks and, and the discussions and, and meet with people uh, to, to talk, talk about these issues. And uh, as a result of that activity, Basically now, I think we are in a much better better position in the world where we do have very very like strong uh, organizations, reputation like Cambridge University and MIT, uh, that and organizations that are associated with them, uh, advancing those uh, those topics. So yeah, I think over the last six years or so, there have been there has been like a interesting uh, evolution of the of the sort of existential risk arguments and uh, and perception of those arguments so so uh, uh, while it is true that uh, especially in the beginning uh, these kinds of arguments tend to draw uh, cranks uh, but uh, there is really an important scientific uh, argument there which is basically saying that uh, Look, technology is getting more and more powerful. Technology is uh, neutral. The only reason why we see technology being good is that there is a feedback mechanism between uh, technology and the market. So, so if you develop technology that's uh, aligned with human values, the market rewards you. However, once you get once you get technology gets more and more powerful, or is developed outside the market context, for example, in military then uh, you, can't, you cannot like, automatically rely on this market mechanism to uh, steer the course of technology. You actually have to think ahead. And, and, uh, and uh, this really has, is the, kind of the general argument that can apply to both synthetic biology, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, and so on. And uh, uh, so one, I think one really good example is the report uh, LA602 that was developed uh, before by Manhattan Project. Uh, during the Manhattan Project, uh, it was six months before the first uh, nuclear uh, test, and they did a scientific analysis of what is the probability, what are the chances of uh, creating a runaway process in the atmosphere that would burn up the atmosphere uh, and, uh, and thus destroy the Earth. And it's clearly, I think it's the first uh, sort of solid example of uh, existential risk research. Uh, that humanity has done, and uh, really, like uh, what we are trying, what I am trying to advance, is more reports like that. Nuclear technology is not the last uh, potentially disastrous technology that humans are going to invent. Uh, so, uh, in my view, it's actually very, very dangerous when people say that, "Oh, these people are cranks," and, and uh, you're basically lumping together uh, those Manhattan Project scientists that developed developed. Uh, Scientific, super scientific analysis uh, that's uh, that's clearly beneficial for humanity, and uh, some uh, some people are just clearly crazy and, and uh, are predicting the end of the world for for no reason at all. I think it's too early to tell the, like right now like what uh, what kind of societal structures uh, do we need to uh, contain the technology once the market mechanism is no longer. Uh, powerful enough to contain them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I think at this stage we really need more research, and uh, there's a like, research agenda coming out very pretty soon that uh, uh, represents like a consensus uh, between AI safety, uh, AI safety community, and AI research community of things that uh, are not necessarily kind of commercial commercially motivated research, but the research that needs to be done if we, if we want to steer the course, you know, if we want to make sure that the technology is beneficial in the sense that it's aligned with human values uh, and thus giving us a better future the way we think the future should be and, and robust in the sense that even 
it wouldn't accidentally uh, create situations where where even we develop it with best intentions, it will still kind of uh, veer off the course and, and give us a disaster. So there are like several uh, technological existential risks, uh, uh, like uh, an example of uh, was the nuclear weapons before the nuclear first first nuclear test was done, it wasn't clear whether this is uh, something sa some, a thing that's safe to do uh, on this planet or not. Uh, and similarly, as we get like, more and more powerful technology, we really want to think about uh, their potentially catastrophic uh, uh, side effects. Uh, so, I mean, it's fairly easy to, for everyone to, everyone to imagine that uh, once we get synthetic biology, uh, it, it becomes uh, much easier to construct uh, organisms or viruses that, that uh, might be much more robust uh, against uh, uh, of, uh, human defenses. I was just uh, talking about uh, yes. uh, existential risk, technological existential risks in general. So, so one of those uh, technological uh, existential risks uh, could be potentially uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So. Uh, uh, now, I want to talk about uh, AI risk uh, to people, then uh, sometimes I ask them like, two questions, like, uh, first, do you, do you have children? And the second, uh, can you program computers? So to people who have children, I can uh, make the point that uh, their children are part of humanity, hence they can't say like, uh, they can't treat humanity as an abstract object uh, and say things like perhaps humanity doesn't deserve to survive uh, uh, so because their children are part of it. They're saying that their children don't, don't deserve to survive, which is hardly what they mean. Uh, but uh, uh, the reason why I ask them whether they can program computers is that uh, can I talk to them about AI uh, in the language what the AI really is. It's, it's a computer program. Uh, so people who are not computer programs, I really can't tell them like, uh, in the exact language. I have to use metaphors, which are, which are necessarily imprecise. So people who don't program, don't know what pro computer programs and, and hence AI really uh, are, uh, are, I think the, one of the easiest arguments to make is that, I mean, look around. What you see in the in the world is uh, uh, you see a world of human uh, human designs and, and human dominance, and uh, the reason why humans really dominate this planet is, is has nothing to do with our uh, like speed or or our I don't know, manipulators. It really has to do with intelligence, uh, however we define it. So the thinking about uh, AI is that uh, if you uh, if you are uh, like creating machines that are more and more intelligence, intelligent, uh, you don't want to in inadvertently end up in a situation uh, that gorillas are these days, for example, that you have a, a smarter agent than you uh, dominating the environment. So, and and uh, so the. As Stuart Russell points out in his uh, commentary on, on the edge.org uh, conversation, the, sort of the worry with AIs isn't necessarily that, that they would be kind of uh, malevolent or, or uh, sort of angry at humans. The, 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 the really the worry that we need to uh, think through and, and do research about is that uh, uh, they will get more and more competent. And uh, if we have a system that's very competent in getting, uh, in, in steering the world towards something that, that we don't exactly want, how do we prevent uh, the world ending up in a, in a place that we don't exactly want? So we need to, need to solve like two uh, challenges. One is to ensuring that AI is beneficial in the sense that it actually would, using its increasing competence, uh, would contribute to the best outcomes as we humans see it. And uh, second, we have to ensure that AI is robust, meaning that uh, uh, once it starts developing its own technologies, once it starts developing uh, uh, like further 
next generations of AIs, it wouldn't drift from the course that we that we wanted to uh, stick to. Yeah. So when I say we, um, one of the sort of weak form of it is that I really mean humanity. It's it's uh, mm -hmm. it's not uh, chimpanzees who are, who are developing these technologies. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's uh, uh, it's humans who are developing the technology. If I want to kind of uh, zoom in and narrow down, then I would say uh, technology developers and and uh, people who who uh, are like funding technologies, people who are regulating technologies, uh, and uh, so more generally put, uh, like everyone who is on the causal path of new technologies uh, being developed uh, is in some way responsible for making sure that the new, uh, new technologies that uh, are brought into existence as a result of their efforts, uh, they are responsible for ensuring that they are uh, actually beneficial in the long term for humanity. I would say that I don't have like any kind of uh, favorites or or uh, of, uh, uh, or any particular techniques within the domain of AI that I'm particularly worried about. Um, I think I'm much more gonna calm about these things than Elon is. Mm -hmm. uh, it, like, perhaps by virtue of just having longer exposure uh, to AI, AI companies and people who develop develop AI. Uh, and I know that they are you know, well-meaning, well-meaning, and uh, uh, sort of people with good in integrity. Uh, so, really, the uh, personally, I think that the biggest uh, uh, things that we need to advance, uh, or biggest uh, research that we need to advance, is is how to analyze the the consequences of uh, bringing about uh, uh, very competent uh, decision-making systems. Uh, so, so to make sure that, well, I mean, simple thing is that that uh, we should always ens ensure that we have some uh, degree of control over them, and we wouldn't just uh, end up in a situation where like this thing is loose and and like there's nothing we can do now. Uh, so, so there is there is some research that can be done and has been proposed, uh, and the, the term for the technical term for this is corrigibility. Uh, most of the technology these days is developed uh, kind of in an iterative manner. You create the first version of technology, you see what, what's wrong with it, you create the next version, and the next version, next version, and uh, each, uh, each next version is, uh, uh, tends to be better in some dimension at least. Uh, but the thing is that once you create like, autonomous systems, uh, and once those autonomous systems get powerful enough, to uh, model uh, the activities of their creators. So to put it simply, like if once once they figure out that there's an off, shift, off switch, they have like instrumental reasons to disable that off switch. So so we need to like uh, think think through like how we construct uh, ever com ever more competent systems to to ensure that they, the outcomes are, are beneficial. So when it comes to uh, control of the Future, like uh, it's it's uh, like eventually end up in philosophy, in moral philosophy, and, and thinking about uh, topics that that how should conflicting interests uh, be like uh, reconciliated uh, when there are like uh, seven billion, perhaps ten billion, etc., etc., uh, people on this planet, and uh, how should we take into account the interests of animals, for example, and and ecosystem in, in general. So uh, it's. Humanity does not know the answer to the question what we really want from the long-term future. And this is again, like in the situation where we might hand off the control to machines, is something that we need to get right.